me, it will give me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor John Brennan to, uh, to speak to us now. John is a Professor of Vascular Surgery in, uh, in Liverpool and he's going to talk to us about the role of endovascular therapy in the acute aortic syndrome. Good afternoon everyone and thank you for the invitation. Uh, the, um, I'm always uh, afraid of these uh, multiple sessions that you end up talking to a room of five people so it's nice to see so many people uh, in the room. Um, endovascular therapy for acute aortic syndrome um, uh, to a, an audience of cardiac surgeons I mean you're not going to be made redundant for the foreseeable future uh, rest assured but certainly I think there's plenty of scope for developing the management of these difficult cases in conjunction uh, with, with interrelated disciplines as, uh, as we've just heard so we've got this interrelated spectrum of these conditions that people are becoming more and more aware of I think the, the important points, and certainly in our experience, is that these are unquestionably dynamic situations. And the presenting CT scan from the referring hospital doesn't necessarily mean that's what you're going to find in the patient when you come to treat them. And certainly repeating scans um, within a short period of time, and certainly when planning endovascular treatment, one wants to have a CT scan quite close to the time of treatment in these situations and not just rely on the initial CT scan. Things do change and can change quite dramatically over the periods of the first couple of days. And ultimately the questions that one's always asked or one is always asking oneself or colleagues in these situations is when should we treat these patients in the time scale of their disease and having made the decision as to when how are we going to do it? What is the strategy that we're going to, to use? Um, this is all fairly uh, straightforward stuff, and I think in the context of a late session, we don't need to, um, to go through that. And the initial treatment clearly is uh, aggressive control of blood pressure, which is not just uh, a couple of pills. We're talking about intravenous therapy, often with two agents, and really, and what we've learned uh, in Liverpool is that this should be done in the context of a high dependency setting uh, ideally in the in the cardiac centre where where, the, where we can make a rapid decision to proceed to treatment if things aren't being successful and and we've just heard about the multidisciplinary aspects and I, and I would emphasize that we're talking about cardiac surgeons cardiologists vascular surgeons interventional radiologists cardiac anesthesia and intensive car colleagues all have a significant part to play in the management of these patients if one wants to get uh, the best outcome. So type A, dissection and intramural hematoma, I think probably are still largely regarded as similar enough entities with the precipitous mortality and therefore by and large the treatment, the intervention remains surgical if the patient is regarded as a surgically fit candidate. It's an incredibly hostile territory for stent grafts and at the moment there isn't really, apart from very limited cases, there isn't really the anatomical configuration to deploy a stent graft. But there is evidence of a role for conservative management, relatively conservative management, of intramural type A hematoma in selected cases. And this is just, um, some of that, lit that the, the literature I saw regarding that was coming out of the, uh, out of the Far East, I think, because, because they get more, or see a lot more of this type of pathology. And this is a type A dissection, a type A intramural hematoma. It's not massively impressive, but it's definitely type A intramural hematoma in the ascending aorta. And you can see it in the, in the descending aorta with a, with a small uh, perfusion branch, bleb, or what, what, what have you, penetrating ulcer. So this is quite extensive type A intramural hematoma from the aortic root down to the diaphragm. Um, and for various reasons, the patient was, uh, the, the, it was, we were elected to manage this patient conservatively uh, without excessive symptoms, control of, aggressive control of blood pressure at, at the heart and chest hospital, uh, and, and his symptoms settled. And this is a repeat CT scan carried out six months later. Uh, I mean, there, there's another one in between, but six months later, because he, he was being looked at for management of a, of a large infrarenal aneurysm, which had nothing to do with his dissection, complete resolution of the previously well-documented intramural hematoma 
no intervention, no, no intervention uh, uh, at all. So there is evidence for that in the literature and we have uh, clinical, ex clinical experience of that ourselves. Uh, so the issue really, uh, in terms of endovascular therapy, comes into its own, or certainly come into its own, in, in the management of type B pathology. Um, so di type B dissection, the majority of them are regarded as stable or uncomplicated, so probably up to two-thirds. And again, as we said, that's medical management with close control of the blood pressure and the IRAD uh, data. Tell us, so that sort of a strategy is associated with a 10% all-comers mortality with the majority of those managed medically alive at one month and, a, and still at one year. The one thing that's perhaps changing is the longer-term management of patients. And I see Professor Ninaba in the audience and has been instrumental, I think, in, in altering our understanding of... Uh, the management of, 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 of initially stable type B dissections. Because the problem with these cases is they have a false lumen. You haven't treated it, so there's a persistently perfused false lumen, which, in the majority of cases, enlarges to a varying degree and becomes ultimately a rupture risk. There is also an element of late malperfusion syndromes, but that is relatively rare. The issue really is false lumen enlargement and subsequent rupture risk. And so when you see these chronic type B dissections with a very large aneurysm, it's often extensive. And what you're talking about is an extensive type 2 thoracoabdominal repair, which, which is something that um, well, is associated with, with, with high morbidity and mortality. So what about the role of early thoracic stent grafting to modify that long-term process? The INSTEAD trial that was initially carried out looked at the early results of the early in terms of taking stable patients and randomizing them to having a stent graft or no stent graft, and there was no early advantage to that because there are complications from stent grafting. But the data that we're seeing now are saying that in those patients who have an early stent graft and survive out to a long period, there's a reduction in late aortic death. Um, and that's the aortic death either from rupture or from the morbidity and mortality of intervention for a large aneurysm. So I think there's increasing evidence and there's probably going to be an increasing drift towards stent grafting a larger proportion of the initially stable patients. And again, this needs to be part of the MDT discussions in individual cases. We just heard about the uh, malperfusion type picture in type A dissection, but of course it's, it, it's, it's the type B part of the type A dissection, if that's, uh, if I'm allowed to say that, 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 that causes the problem. So certainly we see it in type B dissection, and it's the gut. Um, kidneys tend to get, it's usually one kidney gets taken off, so you can, but you can lose a kidney, I guess, um, without too much ado, probably a bit of loin pain. Guts and legs really are probably the, uh, the, the type B bits that we worry about. And, and as we've heard, that's associated with an unpleasantly high mortality. Even when you accept the patient's got malperfusion, you think we'd better do something about it. Unfortunately, the intervention's associated with a high mortality, and therefore that really starts begging or a role for endovascular therapy. Is there anything else we can do to modify this uh, dreadful scenario and, 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 and when we try and manage it surgically we still still have poor results and so that the the principle here and what you can see on the on the, the left here is is a, a type B dissection emerging from just uh, adjacent to the left subclavian artery and on the right is a stent graft being deployed to cover the left subclavian artery I'll come on to that in a second and you can see as the stent graft, it's, it's within the true lumen, so distally it's, it's, it's collapsed down because it's, it's, it's still within the, uh, within the true lumen, which is smaller than the false lumen initially. And the principle, the first principle of this endovascular treatment is to close the primary tear, to, to push the primary tear back uh, and, and to, to sort of re-establish the true lumen at that point. And that's clearly in most cases is either at or just beyond the left subclavian artery and there's an issue about how one manages the left subclavian artery in those situations. 
The principle is that this then promotes intimal remodeling and the initial work that was done by Mike Dake show in models showed that if you close that top tear, the rest of the intimate just went, oh, thanks very much, and just folded back exactly where it was, and all the fenestrations and the vessels, they all lined up. It's magic. Now, of course, in real life, you do see cases like that, but actually, more often than not, it, it's not perfect like that. But it does seem to restore branch perfusion surprisingly uh, successfully, and hopefully inducing, if you've got the intima back properly, false lumen thrombosis, which prevents the long-term complications of, of the initial type B dissection. There's different ways of doing that, and this was a concept that was in introduced by um, Cook Medical, who are one of the stent graft companies. On the, on the left, you can see a standard fabric-covered stent graft, and they're the devices that, that we put in. There's nothing too complicated about it. It's a tube of Dacron with some metal Gianturco stents, which give it the rigidity, and you oversize that slightly to the aorta that you're putting it into. So that's a covered stent graft to close the initial tear, Lower down, what they generated was this uncovered with stent with less radial force that's put in to support the top stent, but to push the intima back in more delicate territories so you could cross the ossea of the visceral arteries as they emerge, and you're still going to get perfusion. There may be stent struts crossing those. It's a fantastic concept. And uh, the, the guys in, uh, the, the team in, in Melbourne, uh, led by Peter Mossop, uh, reported the early experience of the success of this as a strategy. I mean, interestingly, it's, 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 it's one that we've had sitting on the shelf in, uh, in the storeroom, isn't it, in, in Liverpool? <laughs> we've never deployed one. And I went to a congress a year ago where, they, where this was one of the, the key talks, and the guy stood up and said, I'm not sure why I've been asked to talk about this, because I've never used it. Um, as a concept, it's great, but people don't seem to use it. But I think the principle was that, was that it, was, it was to try and generate intimal, intimal remodeling. So it's fantastic, isn't it? You, you don't have to open them up. You just go in through the groin. You deploy a stent graft. Bob your uncle, zero mortality, uh, day case, etc., etc., etc. And, of course, it's not as simple as that. Acute aortic syndrome is a, a, a medical disaster um, waiting to happen waiting to become more complicated. The problems that we have when, when, when determining thoracic stent grafting, the proximal landing zone is a problem. If you have a tightly angled arch, getting, first of all, getting the stent graft round the arch and getting it then to deploy where you want it with all the various forces that are on it can be a problem. The left subclavian artery has been an ongoing issue in that the, it's frequently too close to the pathology that you, you can't, if you, if you don't cover it, then you don't cover the pathology. Therefore, more often than not, you find in the acute setting, you're needing to cover the left subclavian artery. The initial experience was that could be done with relative impunity. You didn't get arm ischemia because the arm's very well collateralized or you very rarely got arm ischemia. The problem is more to do with stroke um, and any intervention, particularly acute interventions in the thoracic aorta, have a frustrating incidence of stroke, um, and that obviously related to perfusion of the vertebral artery, um, and, I, and, and that in the acute setting, the left subclavian artery still tends to be covered and, and on a watch and wait policy in the more elective setting we tend to think of doing a carotid subclavian bypass as preemptive and then covering the left subclavian. But in the acute setting, generally, because of the timing, it, it, it is often still covered in the acute setting. We need to avoid excessive oversizing. Uh, when, when, you, when you're treating aneurysms, you tend to have a generous oversize of the stent graft. You don't want it to be too oversized because what you're treating in the acute aortic syndrome is delicate intima. Um, you don't want to make it any worse. The length of coverage, I've said, was that petticoat technique, which is the one with the uncovered stent beyond it. Increasingly, what's being used is, is further covered stents, and increasingly, in acute settings, one is finding the need to cover the thoracic aorta down to the level of the diaphragm and often to the level of the, 
uh, just above the celiac axis and then therefore there are issues about um, uh, the security of the distal landing zone and making sure you don't cover um, um, important visceral, the osteo to important visceral vessels. There of course the, you need to use adjunctive measures, branch stenting that we've just seen and still even in the successful stenting you, you may still need to do a surgical bypass to a visceral, uh, the SMA or, or perhaps more commonly to the legs. Um, Iron access, access is important. These are large caliber devices going up to sort of 24, 26, 28 French, um, which are much bigger than any of the cardiology devices that are used. Stroke and paraplegia, as with all extensive uh, thoracic interventions, uh, uh, remain a problem. Uh, and, and the one thing that we do also see uh, is, is retrograde type A dissection with a small percentage thereof, which seems to be difficult to uh, uh, avoid. So is type B intramural hematoma, I sort of lumped uh, intramural hematoma type A with dissection together. They're in terms of treatment or decision making, they're not so similar. Um, I did, this is a, 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 a slide, when I wrote this slide it said much less clear, I think it's not much, le it's, it's less clear. The decision making in type B intramural hematoma is less clear than that with type B dissection, but it is it, it's evolving uh, and our knowledge is kind of growing exponentially as we're hearing case series and, and, and sharing experience. Is it all due to a small tear that we just can't see on the CT scan? In other words, if we did a more detailed and a better CT scan, would we see the, the target lesion? Um, there's some evidence that that may indeed be the case. Um, the, the, the guys from Europe are talking about that. I think the bottom line is that if you're going to actually treat a patient with type B IMH for troublesome symptoms, persistent pain, impending rupture, then you're looking at extensive coverage because it's difficult to identify where, the, where you think the problem is. And, and what, we are, 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 what we tend to think is that, well, it's, it's a type B picture, therefore let's start at the left subclavian and go as far as we need to go. It's a presumed unstable intima and therefore just targeting, just doing the central bit, for example, if there's an area of a penetrating ulcer, um, with, with, associated, with associated intramural hematoma, you target the penetrating ulcer, but then there's intramural hematoma on either side of that in an unstable intima. So we have MDD discussion, and we've developed this, um, I'm not sure how you pronounce that uh, strategy, uh, Manoj, the uh, Mugia strategy. You haven't heard of that either, but we're all part of the same team, Manoj. It's called Make It Up As You Go Along. Yeah. <laughs> So it, 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 it's, it's very, we're all learning together. It's a carefully tailored uh, discussion about what you actually do. And, and, and the next case, this case is, is a case in point. This one was batted around between, with the Cricket World Cup going on at the moment. It, 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 was, it got to the heart and chest and it came straight back down the pitch to us. And we knocked it straight back up the pitch to them. This is type B intramural hematoma. I've not done CTs because they runs because they never work as we saw with the previous talk. But it's going right up to the left subclavian. Just beyond that, what you're not seeing is well, you're seeing the beginnings of what was quite a large penetrating ulcer. And this woman had quite persistent pain. She was told that uh, this looked bad. Um, the, the surgeons, uh, uh, in spite of their uh, fantastic capabilities, were re remarkably reluctant. I felt to. <laughs> to get stuck in here, uh, because we, but we weren't happy either because it was right up to the left subclavian and it went right down to the, well, just above the diaphragm actually, and I've given you two slices there because it looks like it's normalizing just above the diaphragm, but actually in, tra in cross section at the same height, it, there's, there's a big penetrating ulcer. But uh, bull by the horns, thoracic stent graft, covering the left subclavian, which you can see some early thrombus in there, all the way down and covering beyond that bit that you saw there, and she's done very well. Acute penetrating aorta ulcer is usually associated with a more widespread process, i.e. IMH. So focal treatment's attractive, but I think in those settings it may not be adequate. 
And in rupture, uh, more logistical issues really that uh, TVAR is attractive in these desperate situations, but it's a very high risk uh, strategy. Um, and you're talking about avail immediate availability of stent grafts, the logistical difficulties associated with that. So these patients can be very challenging. I think the MDT working is, is both uh, vital and also rewarding in, in developing this. Endovascular therapy is certainly being more widely used and is still very much in evolution, as is our understanding of these conditions. And I think there will, we will probably see over the next five to ten years a move towards the early treatment of initially stable type B dissection. Thank you. And thanks very much. We're going to move straight on to the next presentation, if that's okay.